Hi everyone and welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Eva, I'm one of the librarians at the Alameda Free Library and today the book that I have for you is called The Girl Who Drew Butterflies, How Maria Marion's Art Changed Science. Whoops, a little glary there, sorry about that. I thought this story was absolutely fascinating. It's by Joyce Sidman and the inside front cover says before Carl Linnaeus began classifying organisms, before John James Audubon drew birds from the wild, before Charles Darwin proposed his theory of evolution, there lived a 13-year-old girl named Maria Marion who loved to draw bugs. With a keen eye and deft hand, she rendered soft green caterpillars, papery winged moths, and the dazzling intricate beauty of the butterflies. But drawing these fascinating creatures wasn't enough for Maria. She wanted to understand their small, mysterious lives. Where did they come from? What did they eat? And perhaps most miraculously of all, was there a connection between creeping caterpillars and beautiful butterflies? With no formal training or university education, Maria Marion took on the role of artist, adventurer, and scientist in the 17th century Europe, a time when women were rarely allowed responsibilities outside the home, and unusual interests led to accusations of witchcraft. Her intrepid fieldwork and careful observation helped uncover the truth about metamorphosis and changed the course of science forever. Now this book has tons of illustrations in it, so I'm going to turn the camera around so that you can see the pictures while I'm reading you the first and probably the second chapter. The, the chapters are pretty short, so I want to give you a good feel for how the book goes. This is The Girl Who Drew Butterflies. I'll be right back. All right, let's get going with The Girl Who Drew Butterflies, How Maria Marion's Art Changed Science by Joyce Sidman. It's a beautiful cover, isn't it? All right, let's flip it open. There are some end papers for you. There is the title page, table of contents, which we're gonna zip past, a butterfly glossary in case you aren't quite sure what all of the, me the words mean in the book. And let's start with the introduction. The girl in the garden. A girl kneels in her garden. It is 1660 and she has just turned 13. Too old for a proper German girl to be crouching in the dirt, according to her mother. She is searching for something she discovered days ago in the chilly spring air. As she combs the emerald bushes, she looks for other telltale signs. Eggs no bigger than prin pinpricks, or leaf edges scalped by the jaws of an inching worm. Ah, she has found it, a crinkled brown cocoon, anchored on a branch like a sailor's hammock. She inspects its crumpled surface. Any change since yesterday? Any sign of the life within? No, not yet. Her neighbors despise the creatures that fascinate her. They believe that all flying, creeping things are pests, born of filth and decay. If any of them spotted this swaddled cocoon, they would rip it off and crush the vermin within, giving no thought to what it might become. But for years she has gathered flowers for her stepfather's studio, carried them in, and arranged them for his still-life paintings. She has studied the creatures that ride on their petals, the soft green bodies of caterpillars, the shiny armor of beetles, the delicate wings of moths. She has looked at them closely, sketched and painted them. In learning the skills of an artist, she has learned to look and watch and wonder. Imagine this girl, forbidden from training as either a scholar or a master artist because she is female. Aware that in nearby villages, women have been hanged as witches for something as simple as showing too much interest in evil vermin. Yet she is drawn to these small, mysterious lives. She does not believe the local lore, that summer birds or butterflies creep out from under the earth. She thinks there is a connection between butterflies, moths, caterpillars, and the rumpled brown cocoon before her, and she is determined to find it. This is her story. Chapter 1, Egg, April 2nd, 1647, Frankfurt, Germany. 
Maria Sibylla Marion was born on a bright spring day into a family of printers and engravers. Her father, Matthias Marion the Elder, ran a thriving Frankfurt publishing shop, staffed by Maria's older half-brothers and sisters from an earlier marriage. Maria's mother, Johanna, ran the household. In a family business in the 1600s, every hand was busy and the workshop hummed with motion. There was ink to be mixed, paint powder to grind, and copper plates to polish and wipe. There were stacks of paper to dampen before printing and printed proofs to examine. This is what an engraver's shop may have looked like and I'll let you, I'll let you look more closely at that when you, pick, uh, when you check out the book. And there were visitors, always visitors. A publishing house attracted new ideas and a steady stream of explorers, natural philosophers, and free thinkers flowed through Matthias Marion's door. In 1647, the world was changing, expanding. The Thirty Years' War, which had pummeled and bankrupted much of Europe, was finally winding down and intellectual life flourished. Visitors showed up eager to publish stories of their far-flung adventures and strange discoveries in the New World, the little-known Americas. They told of wild savages with completely different beliefs and customs, plants with magical powers, and fantastical beasts bigger and fiercer than any known in Europe. Lively and chaotic, the print shop was the perfect spot for a curious girl. As Maria watched, her father and his apprentices carved maps and illustrations onto copper plates. They slathered each plate with ink, hoisted it onto a groaning press, and pressed it into thick, creamy paper. Every day they transformed outlandish discoveries into books. Every day new ideas and images flew from the wood and iron presses like birds, a river filled with gold, fish with wings, a lizard as big as an elephant. What did Maria think of these freshly printed images hung on ropes to dry? There were no children's storybooks at the time and would not be for another hundred years. Did these images from foreign lands take hold in her imagination instead? Chapter two, Hatching, 1650, Frankfurt, Germany. Before Maria could learn much from her talented father, he died while visiting a mineral spring to take the waters for his health. This left his young wife, Johanna, and three-year-old Maria in a precarious position. Although a widow would sometimes manage her late husband's affairs, Matthias's son from his previous marriage were grown men and quickly took charge of the family business. Johanna no longer fit into the Marian household. Within a year, Johanna married the artist Jacob Merrill. Merrill specialized in painting ornamental flowers, wildly popular in Europe at the time, especially tulips, which had hundreds of varieties. Many artists like Merrill had turned away from historic or religious subjects. The public was demanding a new kind of art that focused on familiar household objects, such as flowers, food, or pottery. This new style of painting was called still life, Maria soon found herself in a household filled with growing things. Roses and peonies bloomed in the garden. Tulips and lilies drooped gracefully in studio vases. Their scent, shape, and color became part of her waking hours. So too did the tiny insects that crawled upon them, the beetles and wasps, the bees that floated from blossom to blossom. Her stepfather prized insects as models and sent Maria outside to capture them. He felt they made his paintings look more alive. Maria puzzled over those insects. No one could tell her where they had come from. Calves came from cows and birds hatched from eggs, but insects? Some said they grew from old things. Flies grew from old meat, moths from old wool. Some believed that sunshine shrank drops of dew into eggs, which hatched into maggots. Still others felt that fire, as it leapt into the air, produced stinging wasps. When butterflies appeared in spring, people called them summer birds, assuming they had flown in from elsewhere. In fact, most people of the time still believed in spontaneous generation, a theory put forth by the philosopher Aristotle in 330 BC, 
almost 2,000 years before Maria's time. Aristotle declared that most insects did not come from other insects, but from dew, dung, dead animals, or mud. At that time in Germany, all crawling things were called worms, and all flying things, birds. No one connected various phases of insects to one another, and no one knew where to fit them into the natural order. Were insects just early forms of completely different animals? Did butterflies eventually turn into birds or beetles into frogs? Even scholars of the time believed insects were creatures that God had not fully formed, inferior, even evil in some way. Every flying, creeping thing, according to the Bible, shall be an abomination. Neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled. Mostly, nobody bothered to find out where insects came from. Flies bit and tormented, caterpillars ate valuable crops. They were pests, enemies of man, beasts of the devil. But Maria watched and wondered about them. This book is so fun um, about a girl who did something that girls technically weren't allowed to do uh, back in her day. Uh, the story just gets better and better. Um, and I hope that you will come check out The Girl Who Drew Butterflies, How Maria Marion's Art Changed Science by Joyce Sidman.